Well, first of all, I have to say it's, this is a tough thing to have as your topic in that we have at least one UN veteran. No, I see a couple of UN veterans in, in three, and a former Assistant Secretary General who is our next major speaker in the room. So there's far more expertise to be mobilized from the people at the tables than what I have to offer. But what, what I really want to do is just kind of give a sense of of my own approach to, to how I connect with the UN and how I uh, how I look to, to connect others in the American public working with chapters. So, but before I do that, uh, I, I just want to get a show of hands. Do we have anyone who's been in model UN in, in your recent or distant past? All right, I see a lot of hands there up across multiple generations. How many people have taken an international affairs class in their lifetime? Majority. Okay, great. Well, you know, from, from my side, you already start with a bow wave of understanding, particularly those model winners. I often find that the real passionate, you know, died in the wool model winners, they understand the system often better than I do because they're out there simulating ECOSOC, they're at, at a, committee, a committee level working in the, the, the minutia of human uh, process and procedure, and, and as a result, we're lucky to have it. But what I'm going to do is just try to pull it back to more of a 50,000 foot level. And Chandi, perhaps you could go to the first slide. That's right. If we think about the public, the public we're trying to reach, what is their impression of the United Nations? To the extent that they have one, it's probably dictated by this, by whatever's happening in the Security Council. That's one of the few things that's covered in the news cycle. So we have this sense of the UN is a convener on issues of importance, and it often that the next part of the story is often like this. This is a, a vote in 2013 on referring uh, the Syria crisis to the International Criminal Court, and of course, the you know you'll see that the Russian hand is not up there. It, it, it got vetoed; it didn't go anywhere. There's often this sense that, that the UN is whatever happens in the Security Council, and when the Security Council doesn't have the kind of consensus among the permanent five to take forceful or dispositive action around an international crisis, sometimes it just leads to disappointment from there. All right, next slide, please. Or how about that, you know? <laughs> That's the UN system, you know? Gillian could walk you through this chapter and verse. Uh, to me, as more of a civilian approaching the UN, it, it looks a little bit like a uh, electrical engineering textbook book, circa 1965, perhaps, you know? Uh, you've got, you know, the, the, the basic, the six major organs of the UN system, you've got the specialized agencies, you have the programs and funds, you got all of that. And yet, if you are a model UN or looking for your next, uh, uh, your next gavel, then understanding all this is perhaps helpful. Uh, if you are someone who is working within the UN system or navigating something specifically as an NGO advocate on the outside, perhaps that's useful. But I think for most of us, that just kind of confuses the picture, you know, unless you're taking a graduate course in uh, global governance or something like that. I've a few of those in my past. Uh, but but I, I think that there's a different level of abstraction that's necessary for understanding, at least for myself, what in, in my own kind of system of belief in the UN connects to things that I care about, uh, but then also trying to, to make the UN perhaps more approachable to a general public. And, you know, for my side, just to give you a, a sense of background, I am learning all the time about the UN system. You know, I felt like I understood the basic facets of multilateralism, you know, when I was coming out of grad school 20 years ago. I um, spent, uh, you know, about six years working in the field in Sub-Saharan Africa, never for the UN directly, but, you know, working in Liberia in the Civil War, often alongside UN agencies. So, you know, I felt like I understood something until I started having to work with this vast, complex theme over two years, and you, you understand the limits of your understanding. But still, even though I have occasion to work with, with so many different aspects of the human system, I think the kind of things that, that inform my connection to it haven't changed that much. And I'll, I'll go to the next slide. The big three. What's that? The big three. The big three, yeah. yeah. Well, because, because to me, I guess, my, my approach to the UN is, is focused on what it is and what it does. And that's a definition that, that we all should reach our own understanding of, 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 of what it is and, and, uh, and where it should be within the, the international system. But, but if you think of it at its core, it starts here. That's Yalta. In fact, at the Yalta conference itself, the announcement was made that the 
Conference on International Organizations, which began in April of 1945, and 70 years ago, there were 5,000 people con uh, uh, convening in San Francisco to create what would become the UN Charter. That announcement happened there. And quite frankly, the assumptions about what that next organization would be were dictated by kind of the, the, uh, the chairs that you see before you. There was a sense that there needed to be an organization to win the peace, but there were assumptions that the, 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 the world order after the peace might look a little bit like the alliance that was fighting the war, that these, these three, adding in China and France, might be able to, to create and enforce a peace that would be persistent long beyond the war. Next slide. So in my mind, when I approach what the UN is, these are the kind of things I think about. You know, first of all, the UN was born as a brand. It was the, the brand of the alliance that was fighting the war. Those three, three folks sitting in their chairs were already part of the United Nations as the brand that was fight, of fighting the war. And the structure of the UN, from the charter on forward, reflects kind of the, the, the decision-making apparatus, the assumptions of how international order would work, that were dictated by that period of uh, defining alliance to fight back against fascism. And then the other thing is, because we get into all these kind of discussions, on the one hand, it's uh, sometimes there's good criticism from the right that, that the, the UN is, represents a global world government movement and is therefore a threat, or we get them from the left too, from world federalists who wish that, that the UN were, were acting more as, uh, as a government. But ultimately, it's not a government. And, in any way, shape, and in fact, I often, as I think about ourselves as the United Nations Association, I think to myself, the United Nations Association is not an association, it's a movement, because we are a movement of Americans supporting a cause, and the United Nations isn't a government, it's an association, you know? It's an association of the member states of the world, it's the most powerful, important, and, uh, and the only uh, globally inclusive association of member states that you can find. And then there's, there's the, you know, what, what I say is, it, is the UN an R or an is? Uh, to me, that's kind of uh, reflecting on the fact that there is no singularity to the UN itself. There's the UN of the member states, what the actual diplomats do, and they are the ones who really run the show in New York. It's not the Secretary General, it's the member states. There's the, the UN of all those programs, funds, and specialized agencies that often report to the boards of directors, you know, so. Uh, the board of directors of, UNI uh, of UNICEF and UNDP. Uh, it, 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 there is no one UN, and it's important to remember that. So that's what it is in my mind. But I, I guess what what uh, drives my connection to it or passion for it is more what it does. So the next slide. Are we closing up here? <laughs> uh, there are two slides. <laughs> and, and the, uh, the first one is, is really a function of what I think the UN does to, in, in essence, impact our lives. And, uh, and to try to explain it a bit, uh, the, there we go, there we go. Fundamentally, you have the UN that, that just allows the kind of connections that, that, that drive a global economy. You know, the fact that, uh, you know, between midnight and 5 a.m. in Memphis, Tennessee, and in Louisville, Kentucky, literally 500 flights took off at each of those destinations, uh, from each of those hubs, to deliver just in time manufacturing products, global commerce coming out of the UPS and FedEx hubs. Those are flights that are going to crisscross dozens of international boundaries, the pilots are going to speak English the entire time. They're going to land at, at airports that operate on the exact same safety standards, the same protocols, all of that facilitated by ICAO. There are all of the, these kind of program sponsored specialized agencies, convening bodies in the UN system that just allow for global connection itself. But those are things that, uh, in, in the words of one of my colleagues in the UN Foundation, he often calls them things that are beautifully silent in our lives. That the, the, the UN system is allowing for these basic connections, uh, but you just assume it's there. You benefit from it. You would be damaged if it wasn't there. Uh, it's almost like uh, you, you know the, the operating system on your computer. You just assume that it's working, uh, and you only re really uh, have an issue with it if it fails you. 
And then, you know, things like on, on terms of promoting innovation and trade, the intellectual property, things like the general system of preferences, that's, that's a function that particularly for the, uh, for the 30 or so UN member states who are not part of the World Trade Organization yet, uh, that they benefit fit from the trade facilitation rules that, that the GSP provides. And then things like the IMF's role, quite frankly, you know, we can walk to the IMF from here, it's right next to our offices. A lot of those World Bank Group IMF employees don't realize they're part of the UN system. The bread and board institutions have, have got, got kind of a detachment in, in a cultural way from the rest of the UN system, but they're very much a part of it. And ultimately, the, the basic financial stability of our system, whether it's in the face of you know, the 2008 financial crisis when Iceland had to be bailed out by the IMF, or just the, the liquidity that, that IMF provides in any, any particular Back here. Sorry about that. Okay. But I, I, this next slide, I think, is what, what is driven by the discussion we had with Kim Payumo and what ultimately, I think, drives the passions of our membership and ultimately is, is the kind of case that we have to make to Congress for, for U.S. support. It's the fact that, that the World Food Program and other uh, humanitarian response agencies within the U.N. system combined reach, you know, feed 100 million people a year. It's the fact that 60% of all children in the world receive their vaccinations through U.N. delivered or U.N. coordinated programs. That's not 60% of the global south or 60% of sub-Saharan Africa, but 60% of the children. So I think it's that that field impact uh, that, that often drives our, our, our true attachment to it. Or on advancing human rights, I think that, that you know, we often get wrapped up by the failures of the UN system, the perceived failures on, on the human rights front, that, that we have a human rights council uh, that spends a disproportionate time discussing one particular uh, global issue, Israel's uh, you know, various relationships in its region, uh, but at the same time, you have the ability of the UN system, either through the Human Rights Council, the work of the General Assembly, the, the, the bully pulpit of the Secretary General himself, to advance, define, and further global norms around human rights. You know, whether that was Beijing in 1995, where the, the kind of articulation that Hillary Clinton started of, of gender rights being basic human rights uh, began and have been amplified ever since, or whether it is the Secretary General's personal commitment now, Ban Ki-moon's personal commitment to advancing LGBT rights through the Free and Equal campaign, that, that even if there are, are things that disappoint you in the human rights agenda of the, the UN, there is this ability to, to define and advance global norms that no other organization is going to be able to do. And then in terms of the kind of core pillars of what the UN does, which these are the three that, most, that I think of in my mind, you could divide out uh, human, uh, humanitarian response is different from development, but really peace, human rights, development would be the, the core pillars. That, that it's within that last 20 years or so where the successes of the Millennium Development Goals, lifting a billion people out of extreme poverty, it wasn't the UN system alone, the 300 million or so Chinese that, uh, that became part of, uh, part of a emerging middle class potentially uh, because of China's rise, that was a big part. But the, but the convening ability of the UN system itself to define some clear priorities, to drive domestic investment, philanthropic investment, overseas development, uh, strategic interventions uh, have been key. So I, you know, I think that, that ultimately, if I figure out what about the UN connects to me in, in terms of my individual beliefs, my values, or my perceptions of US national interests, and where the UN itself advances our, our, our interests as a nation, it's in that, those corners. It's what it achieves in the field. Next slide. And this is the last one. I mean, that ultimately it's up to us to figure out what relationship we think our own government should have with the UN. Uh, your opinions are as valuable as anybody else's. We are a grassroots organization. We, are, we, we have a wonderful history as UN and USA and a wonderful experience in decades past as a think tank. And when I was in, at Georgetown 20 years ago, I, I was reading things that the president of UN and USA was writing as a think tank leader. We're not that anymore. We're a grassroots organization. So 
it, it is the perspectives of the individual member who walks through the door of a chapter meeting at any one of our 150 chapters around the country that matter as much as anything I have to say or anyone else on our leadership. Uh, so to me, th this task that we have of trying to make a case for what the UN means to the United States, what it means to an individual member of your community, it's for us all to decide. And if, if you have concerns about uh, perceptions of weakness within the UN, if you have concerns about individual issues that are in the news cycle where the UN's involved, this is a great time to discuss them. I'm not going to give you any definitive answers. It's just for us, ourselves, to define um, how we how we approach um, making the UN accessible to our members and to the general uh, communities that we're in. With that, we'd love to hear some, some questions. Who's going to jump in first? Okay, we got a UN veteran right here. Uh, very interesting to hear what you have to say, Chris, because I've been working on this in the last year, and it comes out pretty much the same. Uh, I, I do say that that the UN is an organization, a club of governments. It's not a government, it is a club of governments, and therefore you shouldn't expect to be much more than what those governments are. And those governments include the good, the bad, and the ugly. We've got democracies, we've got dictatorships, we've got uh, monarchies, we've got all kinds of people in the club. What is fantastic about the UN is that it becomes an idealistic organization. Uh, and that, I think, is largely due to the Secretary. It puts these countries in a, in a situation where they go to a meeting and they have to play their trump cards. And they're always playing the trump card on how good they are. They don't play the card on how bad they are. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the UN has a major force uh, of bringing idealism into, into development. Uh, the other thing I would add to your, your list is that I do say that there are four elements. It's peace, justice, development, and humanitarian assistance. And you don't need to look at that big chart because every single body in the UN is doing those four things. Uh, and you begin to look at it that way. It's a much more united United Nations than sometimes it feels like. So, challenge. Okay. Excellent perspective. I would well, challenge you also. I will ask Shanti to bring back up the electrical, electrical engineering chart because you're, you're complementing the, the secretary at one of those basic organs, the yep. staff side of the UN. Next question observation. I see, I see Ed, Ed in the back. I'm, I'm in Elmendorf from the National Capital Area. Chris, I would like to suggest that you think about adding one slide about how the UN has changed and changed profoundly as the world has changed also. In the early days, clearly it was more like a club of club of governments. Now, as we began to see more and more, the UN is present on the ground in entirely new and different kinds of ways that were not anticipated when the organization was created. It's too bad that in this country we don't see that. But in the Indias and Ghanas of this world, the UN is very much a presence for people to see, and that's really important for us. Excellent point. I think there's one in the back that we just met. <laughs> Why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my name is Deep Dada, and I'm part of the newly formed Beverly Hills chapter. Um, my question is, and this isn't isolated just to the UN and the UNA, but you know, what's the strategy to recruit millennials to the organization? Because as you said, um, the UNA is just is just us, uh, and from what I see, you know, millennials just don't know that much about what the United Nations is doing, um, nor is their involvement. Know, really where it should be. Um, so the question is, what are we doing to recruit millennials? And you know, is there a, is there a task force to understand sort of the digital communication tools that are coming out and how millennials are engaging with those? Well, it's, it's a great question. Uh, we've had about 12-fold growth in, um, in our millennial membership, and you see a lot of it. The strategy has really been about grabbing those model UNers, you know, so there's this wonderful manufacturing of, of affinity for the UN because of model UN. Uh, but we need to do more than that. Um, and I think in part, Ed's point of emphasizing what the UN accomplishes in the field, you know, in that 
whether it's millennials or others, we tend to, to gravitate toward causes where we can see palpable impact. You know, that's why Ken Paiuma's presentation was, was a value, because that's how those 12,000 lives, I get that. And we need to emphasize that more, we need to use better digital tools. It's a great, great suggestion. Just a quick action request. Could, could John and anyone else who has been with the very excited in Southern California in general. Um, could, could John and Ed and anyone else who's been with the UN and shares maybe see just a moment or two about, about what they did, with the, did at the UN in their, in their involvement? That's great. Let, okay, we've got one question behind you. Let's take the question behind you and then we're going to we'll go back to our human veterans. Hi, I'd like to see a part of our work on where they come from and where it goes to for both UN and UNA not only for 2015, but let's say for 1995 or 1985. Well done. Let's take one more question, and then I'll, I'll respond to these. Ed and John and Gillian and everybody else who's a UN veteran, start thinking about how you're going to tell your story. <laughs> Get ready, Ed. Oh, sorry. It's John. It's John Washington, Philadelphia. Over the years, I have seen that uh, the UN is going to use more and more real science in defending itself and in organizing its programs. It's going way beyond politics and political debate only. And I think that that particular topic needs to be addressed better than explaining that what the UN is doing. The other part is that many of the UN system organizations rely more and more on input from NGOs. We have something like the, the WHO with some, some 600 or 700 NGOs. I think that the role of NGOs in the UN system needs to be clarified as well, because it is a carrying moment. Great. All right, well, I'm going to turn it over to some new veterans here. Uh, but before I do that, I, I appreciate your point, Chris John. I do want to speak to the question about UN funding and UNA funding. Uh, but in terms of UN funding, you have the basic system, the secretariat, and the specialized agencies that are funded through assessed contributions. There's an actual formula that defines what every nation in the UN system pays. We pay more than anybody else in the United States does. And that's why we, we go up and, and, uh, and fight the good fight for congressional funding. And the biggest bill that we have in that is the 28% uh, cost of, of UN peacekeeping that is funded by the United States. So that is, that's a, you know, a big number in and of itself. Uh, and the rest of those formulas are, are derived by, uh, you know, some alchemy to the, uh, to the UN dues system itself. But it means that you have China that pays less in dues than Mexico does, it's in part because of per capita income. Uh, so that's a complex set of formulas, but the, the big story is that the, we're the big, uh, we've got the big seat at the table in terms of financial responsibility. And therefore, in our system, we have a particular importance as an association. In terms of our budget, I'm open about it. You know, we have a $2.5 million budget. That 10 years ago, UNA had a $10 million budget in the old days. Um, we have become a grassroots movement. We're not a think tank doing the kind of things that think tanks do, but we're spending more on membership today than that organization did 10 years ago. Uh, half of our budget goes towards supporting our chapters and our members by sending speakers out, by giving grants to chapters, whereas 10 years ago, it was about 400000 that $10 million budget that was going to, to those things. Happy to show you all the sources, but we, but our focus is on our membership. But with that, perhaps we should turn back to John as our first UN veteran to make his case. Can I put you on the spot too? Okay. Okay. This is unscripted. Uh, I'm an architect. I got into the UNESCO when I was about 25 years old, and I was getting a simple assignment. And that was change the way the world builds school buildings. Very simple thing. Make them cheaper and make them better. No problem. Uh, after 32 years, I ended up leading missions to uh, Bosnia and also to Palestine, planning educational missions to the, the, the ministries, planning the entire system. So we went from building chairs and tables all the way to doing the whole system. Headquarters based, but I did assignments for 65 different countries. 
join us. Thank you, because a million stars. I know quite a few of you here, but not everyone. Um, I've, I've been a lifer with the United Nations. All my career has been the UN working with and for United Nations. For 10 years, I was the New York City Commissioner for the UN and Consulate for Head of the City's liaison office with the diplomatic community, 30,000 diplomats in New York. Then, for the next 10 years, I was Assistant Secretary General, uh, working closely with Secretary General Triscali and Secretary Kofi Annan, and then for about another seven, eight years, I was in the United Nations Foundation, and they referred to me as their national advocate, and I was doing a great deal of public speaking. I was a traveling messenger, uh, ambassador, advocate, behavior, whatever the occasion required. Just in two sentences, if I make this, of course. my sense of the UN is that it is absolutely critical. It is the only universal organization exists, where every country on earth comes together, where we have the opportunity to connect, to communicate, to cooperate, to lead, and, and that is just precious. Why would we turn our backs on that? It is a chance to uh, make a better world, uh, to join forces with the rest of the world, to lead, but also sometimes to follow, um, and it's just unique. It is not perfect. I sometimes would say it's imperfect, but indispensable. And our challenge is to build upon its strengths, even as we recognize its weaknesses. And um, with that, I, I am still a believer. I am a caring critic, uh, as you'll hear when I speak uh, at lunchtime. Um, but I really believe it's a, a unique and indispensable organization for our world. I'm looking forward to the caring critics. I'm Ed Elmendorf. I've been involved in the UN in many different ways for over 50 years. Uh, I started and got into the UN as a junior American diplomat when Adlai Stevenson was U.S. representative to the UN, and after working with him for a while, I became his personal assistant. He died on me. And then I was inherited by Arthur Goldberg when he came off the Supreme Court at the request of LBJ and became Stevenson's successor. One of the things that stands out particularly to me from that era was a personal success of Arthur Goldberg playing the role of the chair of the UN Security Council like the American labor lawyer that he was. And he used those skills Call meetings of the Security Council at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning when there was new information, and he personally stopped the 1965 war between India and Pakistan. That's the U.S. and the U.N. I also had the privilege, going back to what President Morrison was saying, of representing the U.S. government in the U.N. ECOSOC NGO Committee in the 1960s. You see how the world changes? In those days, my major mandate was to do whatever I could to prevent communist front organizations from getting into the UN. Enorm enormous change. 30, 40 years later, and uh, after a career in the World Bank, I come back, and I see how the UN has changed, and I underscore especially what Christian has said. The, the NGO community is central to the organization. We, the NGOs, are allies of the UN Secretary General in helping to move the organization forward in innovation and in doing new things and in pushing the governments to be willing to move ahead instead of dragging the organization into latitude and inaction. Thanks. We are deeply fortunate we've got UN veterans across the country in UNA, and we need to find a lot more of them. Uh, that drive my own knowledge base and that, that, that drive, I think, the passions of so much of our members. But I would love to get, you know, if you got criticisms of the UN system, if you got things that disappoint you, if there are other, if you have perspectives on how how you think we as UNA and USA need to better equip you to engage your communities, this is a great time to ask. So, would love to see some hands here. Birmingham in the back.
Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Birmingham. Rebecca Kenny, chapter leader um, there. Um, one of the things that I've noticed um, through, I work with young people through state department scholarship students and high school students, college students, and the millennial generation that we're really working to connect with and all the digital information that we're putting out and connecting with people. I think it's very effective that we are bringing a lot of young people on. Um, also, we do have the uh, leadership from the UNA, which typically, you know, if you look at the demographics of the room, you have people, there's a there's an age gap that we seem to be having trouble reaching. And so we do have the leadership and the people who were involved in the United Nations Association when it was first started, and um, people who felt the relevance there. But there seems to be a gap where there, were, there are age of people who are the parents of the people that I work with, people my age, that aren't connecting. They felt well protected by the United Nations um, with things that were going on. And when the Cold War ended, I think that they felt like everything was better for us here. We didn't have that fear. And they didn't have the reason to connect um, with, the, with the organization. They, because we had a, just a, a real feeling of um, peace that things were progressing in the nation. But now, of course, the millennials can see they watch the news all the time. We have the digital error and they're all connecting and people the young people want to connect they're seeing what's going on in the world they want to make a difference they want a peaceful world to see what's happening and and social media is affecting the young people but when i look at what the older people are passing around and and um as far as digital media goes it's the feel good stories and the pictures of cats and videos of cats um but they're 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 promoting feel good stories about United Nations people, but are we doing anything to reach that generation? I think there could be more um, publicity and, and more of the media directed toward that generation to help get them involved. Those are the people also who are going on retirement age who are going to be looking for active roles in community service, for things to do, and I think we need to work a little bit more. You are on, you are on to an issue. I mean, we have if you look at our membership, we have this huge bulge of under 25. 60% of our association are under 25. They're in those great campus chapters who are with us, 77 universities with us. Right? But the 62-year-old who's just retired, they've got an entire life in front of them. And they're a lot like the 20-year-old who's defining their issue, issue advocacy. And we need to grab as many of them as possible. You're on some. Let's get, get uh, Mid Peninsula, let's get Monterey in the room, and then we've got over to Milwaukee. I haven't forgotten yet, sir. So, oh, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> My name is Javier Webb. I'm from the United Nations Peninsula, Mid Peninsula Organization. Lost your mom, Closer to the mouth. Okay, so I have a couple questions regarding the elementary schools and the middle schools. As far as UN 101, so I'm going to take it back yeah. to what the topic is. Why I came in here because I go to a lot of these schools and I have to speak to them. And yep. We actually speak to them. We have we just did our first, what we call our inaugural film festival at an elementary school. We did a screening with Casmina. Yeah. Uh, and the elementary school, they love it. We had 90 kids come in and watch the film. Uh, but my question is what would you be, what would your your conversation with the children as far as the United Nations in a, a quick blurb because you have to keep their attention. They're fifth graders, fourth graders, and we have some of these planned for the next school year and let me go on to several different schools doing this. So I want to get anyone in here as the as the commission goes along, come up to me and give me your input because I'm gonna take all of this back and I'm gonna work on the presentation. An elevator pitch to them and also a longer presentation that I'd like to give them. So I'm doing elementary school, middle school, and high school. So I don't think it's really an answer to that. I'm going to go to another question, but can somebody think about how you're going to answer his elevator pitch? We're going to go to go to Milwaukee and then I'm going to grab somebody who wants to answer his elevator pitch. Go ahead, Milwaukee. Hi, I'm Steve Latris uh, from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I wonder, Chris, when you mentioned the UN being the most powerful organization in the world. Somebody added, why would we turn our back on that? It does some things great, it has tremendous ambitions and other things maybe not fully fulfilled, etc. But I wonder what you would say to the line of thought that says that uh, a certain amount of power has been kind of leaking away or moving away from the UN 
to these uh, trade and economic um, uh, agreements such as uh, NAFTA, the WTO, and the upcoming Trans-Pacific <coughs> Partnership. I'm not saying it's a good thing that it's leaking that way. I've spent a fair amount of time opposing those things. But it seems like they've moved outside the UN to do things in a sort of lopsided cor pro corporate way, different than might have happened had those kind of agreements or keeping up with the times uh, happened within the United Nations. Excellent question. I spent about 10 years working for this, so, but we can all get along. It's, uh, I, but yes, is there more attention on uh, the trade policy agenda and, and the, the kind of changes in global governance that trade policy creates because it has dispute resolution panels, it has law attached to it? Uh, you know, perhaps that is more prominent. Uh, good point. But the UN continues to play a key role in trade. A, a, a role that, that, that's known a lot less than, than the attention that we get for WTO and NAFTA and other, uh, other aspects of bilateral or regional trade agendas. Okay. Ginger's ready to answer the question? Oh, yes, I'd love to. Can you hear me? I'm Ginger Stillman with the Southern New York State Commission, which encompasses a number of chapters uh, and non chapter people as well. Um, what is that way? All right. Uh, Westchester chapter, uh, I'm not sure if there's any women here from there, uh, except maybe George, has uh, for about seven years now worked with third graders in the Yonkers City school system and bringing the message of peace makes the world a better place. And with that message, we have uh, some materials that are presented, and then we ask the children to draw their vision of peace, and they can draw it relation to the UN or international things or the playground or the school or their home life. And the results are fascinating and it's a way of introducing them to the United Nations. Uh, we always have a dozen languages in most classrooms because of the nature of the city. And that's another aspect of bringing this home to people. Uh, the other thing that's been done with West with uh, the division is Started, this is our second year, a video contest for middle and high school students. And that, uh, I can show you the results online. And then we also, our, some of our chapters have essay contests. And there are other examples of things that we've done. So I'd be glad to share. Excellent. Thank you. And while the mic moves over to Gainesville, Florida, I think we've got a reaction there. I also want to note that David, Ginger's husband, is also a youth. Yes, I'm Taryn Edurabi from the Gainesville, Florida chapter. In response to the uh, question the gentleman had and to follow up with uh, the comments was made previously, uh, in our community what I have done is there are two storybooks that's published through UN uh, quite a few years back. And it was very uh, productive in our community that I contacted the library as well as the school teachers that I was familiar with and share their contribution. One was for water and one was the, con what is UN? As well as using general storybooks that would reach the hearts of our children, especially elementary school children. And when I got to high school, the novels that our uh, students are scheduled to read as part of the protocol, we connected that through contacting the teachers, social studies teachers, as how oh, this story is taking place, like say in Africa, can be expanded on it and related and connected to teacher. I'll be happy to further, uh, you know, share with you additional thoughts that I gain. Thank you. Other questions? Hi, George. I'm George. I'm the George who lives in Westchester County that Ginger just referred to. I'm with the Southern New York State Division also, and we have an energy project. And I want to give a plug for the UN Foundation and support for getting the UN system organized around sustainable energy for all. And we've just had a meeting on that. Uh, it's central to the sustainable development goals. It's central to the climate change actions that will come out of Paris. And I commend it to your attention. Up front, is this Michigan State? Am I guessing right? No! no. <laughs> I'm Alex Holt. I graduated from Copper Hills High School just two days ago, and I'm part of the Utah chapter. Uh, <laughs> 
Uh, just uh, responding to what you were talking, in my experience high school, we, I took an international relations class, which didn't count for any curriculum, more of elective, more for Model United Nations, which led me to the United Nations Association. However, the problem isn't a whole bunch of like, getting a whole bunch of uh, resources out there, because resources are prevalent. Uh, yeah. with this organization. A lot of the problem is with the teachers themselves. The teachers don't know how to teach international relations. For example, my teacher was a terrible teacher, even though I won't go into specifics, but what you need to do is get more education to the teachers themselves so they can also help teach these people about uh, Model United Nations, international relations in general, and the United Nations Association. That's what I would do, get resources to the teachers. Thank you. I'm actually from Michigan State. Um, I'm Monica. Uh, yep, my name is Monica. Um, so, to be frank, I um, am in a national affairs program where we are taught to be critical, analytical, analytical, and critical. And most of my colleagues are actually very doubtful of you. And um, is uh, anyway. Turning their back at us, you know, we talk about how you know we're doing all these amazing things, and I think a lot of my colleagues believe that these things are too good to be true. We want to get our truth. We want to hear how are we dealing with um, the problems that you know are face or whatever in the situation. So I'd love to open up the question to not only elementary, you know, middle school, high school, but also what we would say to college students who have now learned that you know mistakes have been made, but how are we going to my name is Mohammed Naveer Muntaka, and I go by Naveer. Uh, I'm from State College, Pennsylvania, Center County Chapter at Penn State University. First, I'm going to respond to uh, your question, and then my, I will have a question after that. I think another approach would be in addition to add to what you said and uh, what both of you said, uh, to involve instructional designers in terms of designing uh, uh, programs for elementary schools. Um, I think if we could involve them in this process, it would be more uh, beneficial um, because they are special so you specialize in designing uh, things like that. And uh, most importantly, in, 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 including uh, images and uh, cartoons for those that, uh, age levels. Excellent, thanks. Other interventions on the table? I think we've got, way in the back, way in the back. Hello, my name is Tui Nguyen. I'm from uh, Houston chapter. I just joined UA Hyper a couple months ago. This is my first time in the meeting. And thank you for a wonderful meeting. Uh, I have a question regarding to uh, UN roles in uh, uh, interface uh, dialogues and communication. Uh, as the main role of UN is peacekeeping, and we all know that. Most of the uh, conflict uh, and war is from the context, so uh, uh, beginning from the context of religions, different religions, and the pressure in the the university is the uh, is the uh, uh, is the trend of the uh, there's a pressure need for religious uh, for interfaith dialogues and communication to uh, have to be an environment that people can understand each other and learn from each other and to uh, restore peace. So what is the, uh, is the UN, does the UN role have any intention to uh, promote interface dialogues and communication and uh, partnership with uh, religious leaders to uh, empowers the dialogues between religions to help peace, to build peace for the future and you. 
It's an excellent point, and given that the Pope's going to be speaking at the General Assembly in the not so a distant future, uh, a great one to, for us to be highlighting and thinking about more. Other interventions? Over here. Oh, Michael. Uh, Michael Eaton from Minnesota. Uh, and because Mel knows me, he's asked me to be brief. For those of you that would like to continue the dialogue about education and what UNA is offering to teachers, I'd like to invite you all to come to the session at two o'clock or to find people afterwards because we'd like that to be an ongoing dialogue and a way for you to help us identify people in each of your chapters so that we can share things from around the country of how to continue to engage people. So instead of a question, a commercial, my apologies. Um, in terms of education, I sort of have a unique experience since I was high school model. You want to my high school model web club. I've staffed conferences both for high school, middle school, and elementary school. And last semester, I actually went back to my high school and was their Hollywood advisor. So I'm all UN all the time. Um, and I think that one of the things that a lot of our UN programming is missing um, is sort of leadership for the kids. Because a lot of times, what we do is we go, this is the topic, and this is the research that you need to do, and you're going to come in and do this. But one of the things that my organization like really likes, uh, that my high school likes to do, is to give the kids like leadership, leadership opportunities. As in, they got to elect their own officers that all have their own ideas. Um, our school has like an advocacy branch where they're doing a lot of advocacy within the school, like Boko Haram awareness. Um, so I think one of the issues that we have is that we really underestimate high schoolers and middle schoolers and what they can do, um, not only in Mali but sort of organizationally and logistically. Uh, a, a, a girl that I mentored is like running, she's like 16 and she's running in a thousand person conference in October. And it's all student run. Um, and I think that it's really important, um, and as you said, to give teachers resources on how to do international relations. But I think another important thing is to give them resources in how to recruit students, how to structure your organization, how to get their school board involved, how to do PR, um, that sort of thing. So that's another key component that was missing. Um, for people, and then that's another good way to get the generational gap is to get those kids' parents involved. Excellent. Thank you. We've got Chris John and then one in the back, and we're going to need to wrap up, but we'll have lots of other discussions like this. Uh, you had um, asked for some criticism. I'm sorry. Am sorry. I right? Go ahead, go ahead Chris John. Go ahead. Am I supposed to speak or not? Yes, it's. it's Christian you know, Rossi? Yes. So you asked for some criticism of the UN system. I want to give three. One of them is the enormous bureaucracy that seems to be needed to be organized. We have also the problem of some big countries and small countries having the same f level of vote and strength of vote. It kind of sometimes sets up a debate between different regions and stuff like that. The third one is the most important one as far as I'm concerned, is that we have silo tendencies within the uh, UN system. It took FAO and the World Health Organization to 2001 to have a first joint declaration. But we have to work on integrating more the communication within the UN system. Hard to make bureaucracy and silos exciting. Aaron's going to be the last point. Uh, Mel, behind, behind Christian, in that far corner in the back, there's a gentleman who's had his hand up the whole time. And Aaron, yeah. I'm going to give you a so I'll, I'll be very short to let us back. Oh, yeah, you go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I'm Aaron Etra from the New York chapter, but also co-chair with Diane Whitehead of the Council of Organizations. I think uh, another opportunity to learn that we have as NGO members is from other NGOs. And that's one of the activities that the Council of Organizations uh, supports and encourages. Uh, we uh, have connections to all the NGOs around the world through various bodies like the NGO DPI Executive Committee on which we sit. And in the conferences that that organization runs, uh, as took place last August, where 2,200 people came from around the world. Uh, so I think that's something that we can both give and receive information about the United Nations, different perspectives about it. Uh, I encourage everyone to come to our session at 2 p.m. Uh, to learn more and to contribute more. It's an open session. We're looking to hear you. We're looking to share our experience. So please come at 2 p.m. Thank you for that. And sir, to close us out. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is, listening to some of the discussions about the education piece, and I think it's absolutely crucial. I'm uh, from the University of Houston downtown, and uh, we're starting a chapter, and this is our first year here, and very excited about everything that we're learning and hearing. But I was, I was curious to find out what you would say to 
faculty like myself who is interested in supporting but maybe don't know or are uninformed about the number one concern that may promote a UNA and thus the UN as a whole? No, thank you. From my side, to, to speak to that last point, you can also speak to our Michigan State point. You know, for me, what motivates my attachment, and I think the attachment of, of you know, the skeptical audiences in Congress that we have to convince, is the impact that the UN has in the field. Um, you know, I was in grad school at the Master of Science and Foreign Service program at Georgetown, where Rachel's going to be starting soon, 20 years ago, when, when Srebrenica happened, when Rwanda happened, and came out really skeptical, like your fellow students, like a lot of folks in Texas, and my roots are in Texas. But then, you know, I had a job working in Monrovia for an NGO, NGOs are important, uh, and was personally dependent on peacekeeping for my safety. Could see the flaws of it, the limits of training of the soldiers that were deployed in, in that particular peacekeeping mission, but knew that there was nothing else beyond it. So I, I think emphasizing what the UN achieves on the ground, whether it's the Ken Payumo story, whether it's the 100 million people fed through the World Food Program and others, whether it's the 60% of children who are vaccinated. That's what drives it for me. But thank you, everybody.